Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. A speechwriter for President George H.W. Bush, Andrew Ferguson is a senior editor at the Weekly Standard, the author of Fool's Names and Land of Lincoln. Andy's most recent book is entitled Crazy You, One Dad's Crash Course in Getting His Kid into College. Andy, welcome back. Thank you for having me, Peter. Crazy You, I quote, the subject of college admissions entangle our deepest yearnings, our vanities, our social ambitions and class insecurities, and most profoundly, our love and hopes for our children. With the largest questions of democracy, of equality, fairness, opportunity, the social good, even the nature of happiness. Andrew, how did you come to write this book? Well, uh, as, I, as I say towards the beginning there, what happened was, um, all of a sudden, things started arriving in the mail that I wasn't expecting. And it was um, brochures, which I now realize are called view books. Colleges call them view books. View books. And they started clogging my email <laughs> and my, um, my real post uh, box there on the front of our house. And uh, I realized that my son was being solicited, like he was a sailor in dry docks or something. And, uh, these things were so expensive and uh, expensively produced. They were on this thick kind of paper like a rubber tree plant leaf. You didn't know whether you were supposed to read it or slurp it like a giraffe. And uh, the whole thing was clearly designed for a boy of our financial class and his academic achievements. They knew you. They knew him. Right, which and I didn't somewhere know somewhere in some database he existed. Yeah, and uh, that was one of the things that got me on is how did they know so much about my son? And I found the answer to that, which is sort of unnerving too. But anyway, I realized all of a sudden that this thing was totally different from the process I'd known when I was a kid. Which was? Which was, uh, I think I, uh, I was living in Chicago, growing, grew up there with my parents, and. Um, realized that I wanted to get as far away from Chicago as I could and still remain in the contiguous United States, which meant California. And uh, so I went to the uh, library. There was a little book of colleges. There was no U.S. news rankings. There was no Fisk guide. There were none of these elaborate things that you can get on the web. And I thought, okay, there's these five schools there, and I'll just apply to them. And I sent away a little note to them all, and they came back with a little tiny application, one page, and I sent that off, and some of them I got into and some of them I didn't, and that was it. And my parents said they could afford this one, but not that one, and so there we were. So off you went to California. Yes, but that's not, that's not the way it is. So how did they know so much about your son? Well, uh, there is a huge industry attached to the business of higher education a sort of parasitic industry. It's kind of a big carbuncle. Um, and a, you admire a, it profoundly. A, a large chunk of it is uh, devoted to uh, information that is gathered on the PSATs, which are the practice SATs that kids take when they're uh, freshman, sophomore year. Just about every kid takes it in the United States, every college-bound kid. And before they take that test, and they're sitting there in their classrooms and their little desks, and they have to say what their interests are, what kind of uh, classes they'll like to take in college, what sort of um, part of the country they would like to live in, would they like to go to a campus where there's uh, a lot of freedom and lifestyle, or would they like to go to one that's more rigid, and on and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. So by the time all this has the feel of the mandatory about it. The kid yeah, just well, doesn't I, know well, anything. Well, right? yeah, you can opt out, uh, but you know you're what, what you're a fifteen year old right, kid, and right. you're just um, and so these this enormous amount of data is uh, gathered uh, both by private firms and by the college board, and then it is sold to colleges at about thirty cents a name. So a college can say, you know, I want somebody who wants to go to a conservative campus and really wants to study abroad and is interested in equestrian studies, whatever. And so by God, tap, 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 and then out comes, you know, what, 3,000 names. And so they can target their mailing, as we were getting in our mailbox, to, to these kids. You know, it's, it's almost, I've mentioned this to professional marketers, it's almost beyond their wildest dreams. If you were a marketer and you knew the name 
and location of every, so let's say you, were, you wanted to sell cars. You knew the name and location of every person who wanted to buy a car next year. Ford Motors should be so lucky. You knew exactly yeah. what kind of stick shift they wanted or uh, upholstery on the uh, seats. Uh, th th people would kill for that kind of thing. Uh, so it's one of, the, one of the ways that the industry is like every other industry, but also very unlike every other industry. Crazy you. A decade after the Morrill Act of 1862 became law, Morrill Act expanding college education, slightly less than 2% of Americans between the ages of 18 and 21 were in college. 2%. Today the figure is more than 60%. How did that happen? Well, it's a great democratizing impulse on the part of Americans. And um, after the, especially after World War II, there was the famous GI Bill, which was based on the idea that the, that the men who had been defending us and uh, trying to keep us free deserved whatever kind of future they could build. And so they were entitled to go to college um, pretty much gratis. There, was, there were little fees involved here and there. But anyway, so we had an entire generation of people who never would have thought about going to college, going to college. Mm -hmm. um, and it became an expectation of the American middle class. This whole process got distorted when the people who were running the education establishment realized that they had started to build enormous dormitories and classrooms and, uh, you know, gyms and things like that. But there was going to be a tremendous drop off in the number of kids who were going to be applying to college in the late 70s. So they had all of this capacity. Baby boom burst goes through. Right. And then it drops. And then, yeah, and they're left with this, all this capacity. So they realize we have to get customers. This is going to become a highly competitive situation. So that's when these marketing gimmicks started and, and the intense salesmanship that you see. Segment two, numbers. <clears throat> Would you please describe the meeting between two of your friends? One is the columnist, George Will. And the other is the U.S. News employee and editor, Bob Morse. Yeah, I was uh, taking uh, Bob out to lunch in Georgetown here down the road. And uh, uh, we went to a table and I saw that was, uh, George Will, who was a distant acquaintance of mine. And uh, Bob said he would like to meet George, so I took him over to the table. And, and I said, George, this is um, Bob Morse. He's the one who puts together all the U.S. News college rankings. And... Will stood up and did a bow and said, the most powerful man in the world. It's a pleasure. And then he slipped him 50 bucks to try and get his kid into college. <laughs> Didn't um, and it's actually kind of true. If, if you talk to people uh, at universities and colleges, uh, there are two things that, that they, you can guarantee. One is that they hate the U.S. News and World Report rankings because they corrupt the pure activity of higher education. And number two, if they get a good ranking in the U.S. News rankings, they are going to send out press releases and post it on their website and brag about it to every fundraiser that they can find. Uh, so it's this sort of dichotomy in the view of the uh, industry. I guess some people would call it hypocrisy, uh, but I'm yeah, hypocrisy. They pretend to hate U.S. News when, in fact, they, they 14, will use it. Roughly 1,400 institutions of higher learning in the United States. How can U.S. News, how can Bob Morse, friend of yours though he may be, hope possibly to rank them? Well, they're very realistic about this. You know, it, people are very down on the U.S. news rankings, except for the people who use them and use them in a pretty... Which is also the same people who are yeah, very down actually, on them. Right, right. <laughs> um, but I'm actually quite... Uh, I'm a defender of the U.S. news rankings for this reason. Uh, without them, the process would be even more mysterious than it is. Uh, when U.S. news decided um, that they were going to pursue this college ranking thing, what had happened is they they had a annual issue of the most powerful men in America, and they were almost always college presidents. So they decided, well, if we're going to have these college presidents, let's ask them what they think the best colleges are in America. So they sent out the form, and it came back, and to U.S. News, is the editor's intense astonishment, uh, the thing just flew off the shelves. The issue was, mm -hmm. was so popular, and they realized they had tapped into something. something. So it got more elaborate, and they turned it into a more statistically meaningful survey uh, to become what it is now, which is a huge franchise. 
before they did that, before they made the decision to try and rank colleges, uh, you ne a parent never could have found out things like acceptance rates, average SAT scores, faculty-student ratio, class size, all this kind of stuff that parents now have access to wasn't there 30 years ago before U.S. News decided to uh, poke them a little bit. And I think that's another source of the resentment towards U.S. News. And so it helps parents as shoppers. Does it have an overall effect on higher education in the country? Yes, it does. Uh, and again, that's... That's not altogether salutary, though. Well, it depends. Right. If you, let's say you're, uh, they call it climbing the page in the business. If, if all of a sudden your rankings go, start to go up, you're climbing the page, which is what every college president wants to do. Um, it's sort of like the greasy pole of success, except it's a page in a magazine. Uh, what they, the way that they will try and game the system, that is to climb the page, are often things that actually make for a better experience for um, for the students, which is, let's say, they ha hire more PhDs, which may or may not be good. They, they reduce their class sizes. That helps them climb the page. Um, they get have more office hours, things like that that really might actually help the, uh, help the kid who's Right. trying to get an education. You write, again, crazy you, there's lots of useful information about outcomes in American colleges and universities that's not public, that right. U.S. News can't get its hands on, that even now parents can't get well, their now, hands on. Well, now we really get to the heart of the matter, and uh, one of the reasons that people pretend to hate U.S. News is precisely this thing, that they can't tell you the essential question that every parent wants to know, which is, is there any learning going on at this school? How do I find out if the kids are actually doing something other than drinking beer and lying out in the sun or the snow or whatever they do. Uh, and there's really no way for us or for U.S. News to know that. There are rankings that have been, or not rankings, but surveys that have been done of college students from freshman year to their senior year, but those are proprietary. And each college has its own set of data that shows how satisfied the kids were, how much time did they spend with their teachers? How much time did they spend reading books? How much time did they spend in laboratory and so on? All of this information is there, but the colleges won't let it out. So then they go around and they criticize U.S. News for you know, being unscientific because there's no, no outcomes. It's only inputs. Are we in favor of the SAT? Uh, the SAT is another thing that get, I think gets a, a bad rap. I, I defend a lot of the... Uh, okay. I defend a lot of the um, sort of the great uh, big... Uh, I don't know, how would you say it, the, the, the big whales that, that uh, higher education bureaucrats pretend to hate. Um, the SAT has been shown for over many years, it's probably the most intensely studied piece of academic work product in history. It's been studied upwards, backwards, forwards, and it's been established beyond really any kind of reasonable doubt that it predicts certain things about how a kid's going to perform. The problem is that there are very stubborn gaps in who does well on the test if you classify everybody by race, let's say. Now, why it's so important to classify everybody by race in a country where we're supposed to merit attaches to individuals and not to groups, uh, that's a mystery. Nobody quite explains it. But because this gap in mm. achievement shows up, there is a very strong and highly politicized move among college admissions officials to get rid of the SAT and sort of decommission it so it can't be used as, uh, in the admissions process. Segment three, <clears throat> Andrew Ferguson, rock star. On your own years as an undergraduate, you were, went to Occidental College in Southern California, quote, I explored the great city of Los Angeles, joined a rock and roll band, became a regular at a Zen temple, attended concerts without numbers, swooned through doomed romances. You must have enjoyed that swooned and doomed. You must have, you must have paused. You must have paused when you were writing that. Swooned through doomed romances and pursued a dozen other forms of fun that had nothing to do with traditional education, and all of which, more to the point, could have been pursued at a much lower cost if I hadn't pretended to be a student, close quote. Too late now, the book's out. But yes, how much of this did your son know as he was applying to college? Well, you know, it's almost as though the question doesn't arise because we don't let it arise. That the 
Oh, oh you mean about I my mean about your, oh. yes, yes, yes. Did you say, now listen, son, don't do as I did? Uh, no, he doesn't know anything of that until he reads the book, especially the part about the swooned through doomed uh, romances, which I think he's busy doing right now anyway. Uh -huh. but, right. I, but what I was trying to get at there is that we have a terrible confusion in our beliefs about higher education in America. Of course, it's we believe that everyone should go, and at the same time, we don't know why. What is college supposed to do? Is it supposed to be, you know, leisure time for spiritual nourishment so you can read the best that's been thought and said and so on? Or is it training for a job? Or is it, as in the case of many people, a booze cruise, which is, uh, from what I can tell, what my son is uh, embarked on right now. But uh, anyway, this confusion dates all the way back to the democratization that we talked about earlier of higher education. So we don't know, are, are we just training people to get jobs or are we trying to nurture them to become better citizens? Well, so so back, back, back when it was 2% in college, that was what? In those days it was training an elite to teach. Right. It was right. really quite strictly intellectual formation, right? right. Yes. No booze cruises, right. no vocational aspect. Yeah. So the, the the confusion about what college is for dates from the second end of the Second World War. Right, it's pretty recent. Right. Oh yeah. It's and, and it, we're the only country that suffers from it too. I think. Um, by the way, you've got <laughs> one of the themes that runs through here. You quite often in the book express a little exasperation with your son's relaxed attitude toward <laughs> the college application. I'm just wondering what effect all of this. I'm anticipating, I suppose the the final chapter here a little bit, but I can't resist asking right now, what effect did the whole process have on your relationship with your boy? Well, at times I thought it was doomed. Uh, <laughs> seriously, I mean, and I had ongoing conversations with um, a number of parents about this. The worst part, the absolute worst part, was uh, when we actually did the applications. You notice we, I said, we, we, see? I thought you'd at least suppress it in public. <laughs> no, I'm sorry about that. That just came out. Um, when he was doing the applications with some assistance from his father. Editorial assistance, yes. uh, perhaps. And of course, you, you call them applications, but really what they are, is, the application is a little form that you fill out. The heart of them are these essays that they ask uh, the kids to write, which are almost all sort of touchy-feely and, you know, tell us your emotions. And one of the college counselors told me, at, uh, I mentioned that we were having trouble writing these essays. She said, well, you just have to tell your son to tell us his innermost thoughts. Dig deep and, and tell us what he's really thinking. And I said, lady, he's a 17-year-old boy. He doesn't have any innermost thoughts. <laughs> and if he did, you wouldn't want to know what they are, and neither do I. So instead of just saying, you know, tell us about your uh, a political issue that you would like to solve or something. It's sort of, tell us about your most embarrassing moment. Mm -hmm. you know, tell us about the time where you really thought you were most you. Things like this that are just antithetical to a 17-year-old boy's and girl's, I think, some somewhat uh, way of thinking. But of course, it fits perfectly into the whole self-esteem culture that these kids are coming out of. Andy, up. Uh your 1978 tuition bill was $5,100, corrected for inflation. Today, that would be 16500 Occidental College now charges $40,000 a year. Occidental, like institutions of higher learning across the country, has increased its tuition much faster than the rate of inflation. Why? Well, that is the great unanswered question. Uh, and it's the one that, that bedevils parents. Uh, but if you purchase Crazy You, you will find some answers. Yes, absolutely. Right. I mean, I, I embarked on this. The, the short great, answer. The great until now unanswered right, question. Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Thank God for me. Um, <laughs> no, the, the, the best answer, uh, and of course it's not a complete answer, came from Richard Vedder, who is this very uh, courageous specialist in uh, education and economics. And uh, I said, why the hell does it cost so much? Why do they keep raising their prices? And he said, why do they keep raising their prices? Because they can. Who's going to stop them? And of course, this is true. Parents like me are going to do what is necessary to get their kids through the four years of college and hope that they have a wonderful experience. Why? 
You served, you served <laughs> in a Republican administration. I served in the Reagan administration. We've spent, who knows between us, how many hundreds of speeches we've written praising the workings of free markets. The market doesn't seem to operate here. No, there is no supply and demand. The whole, that whole mechanism has broken down because, uh, as I mentioned, the sort of elastic demand that comes from people like me will just keep figuring out a way to pay for it and the colleges keep raising their price at the same time of course politicians both republicans and democrats have been vastly expanding the pool of aid you see there are a hundred hundred at, at present there are hundred and forty three billion dollars available in aid each year right isn't that just a direct subsidy to the educators of absolutely, america absolutely absolutely which is why so much of the college literature is not really about you should go to school because it will do x or y to you it's just you should go to school. You know, don't worry about the money, go to college. Just go to college. The college board literature is like this. The U.S. News participates in this as though the abstract ideal of college were in itself Enough. justifying. Yeah, just sort of self-justifying. Well, of course, everybody has to go to college, right? We know that. Mm. Segment four, you call this an education? Crazy you. In the 1970s, the revolution of a decade before was ratified in, as everyday life. Core curriculums were jettisoned. Parietal rules struck down. Curfews abandoned. The general shape that schools assumed in the 1970s stubbornly remains. Every poll indicates that faculties at institutions of higher learning vote Democratic over Republican by 80, 90 percent to 20 or 10 percent. These are overwhelmingly liberal institutions. Yes. How is it that they're so conservative? Uh, the Why kids. They s they're stuck in the culture of three and four decades ago. Uh, you mean the kids? Why are the no, kids? No, no, I mean the, the, well, you, you oh, the, the why don't structures, they grow? The, yeah. the general right. shape of the schools that they assumed in the 1970s. Right. No curriculum. Because it works to the advantage of the people who run the schools. Uh, they are. Um, by say getting rid of parietal rules, which you know say that the kids got to be in the dorm by you know and no girls and no boys and all that, um, no drinking and so on, it makes their job a much easier um, because they don't have to Check. do bed checks. <laughs> I mean, I saw my wife uh, formulated a fantastic rule on the uh, on our college tours, which of course everybody ends up doing. Uh, who's everybody who's in this awful position? Uh, and we went to one school, and uh, she said that, you know, the way you get behind this kind of Potemkin village of a school that you see when you get the tour, go into the bathrooms, in the dorms, in the unions, because they all have bulletin boards, and they all, that's where they put up what's really going on. And uh, sure enough, right, we were at one school, and I went in, and on the bulletin board there was a big poster advertising uh, a sex fair that was going to be there next weekend with a sex demonstration and they were giving out free condoms, free dental dams, and free Ben and Jerry's ice cream. I mean, I, my first thought was, you know, when I went to school, we didn't need free ice cream to come to a sex <laughs> demonstration. It was, we were there. Uh, but the other thing was, this is, this is what life is like in college. You could get a degree, I'm quoting you now, you could get a degree in the humanities at one typical college you write without studying literature. By the way, the college that you're writing about, <laughs> I happen to know, is the one your son, my is, son is in. Yes, right. You could get a degree in the humanities without studying literature or a degree in history without ever sitting through a survey class in American or European history. Close quote. This is an outrage. It's uh, almost a total collapse of intellectual standards. Um, and again, it's our fault. I mean, I, I, I feel just, just in a sense that it's the... It's not my fault. Whose the, fault? It's the, it's the fault of parents generically who want to send their kids to college, and I'll tell you why. I must have had, and not just simply because of this book, I must have had hundreds of conversations with worried parents about how to get their kids into this school or that school. I've had less than five about what they're supposed to do when they get there. I was one of the few parents I knew who even sort of hovered over my son when he chose uh, the classes he was going to take. And even that wasn't much help because when we arrived on campus to drop him off, he was required to take a reading class, uh, or I mean a, a literature class where he would do a lot of writing. Uh, he only had three options. One was Mad Men and American Life. The other you was... Mad Men, the television The television show. 
The second was a history of the 1960s. And the third was intro to queer theory. So I was thinking maybe, maybe I ought to put him back in the car and take him home. But I didn't. Andy, and it's my fault. It's, throughout this book, you see you sit there smiling with a twinkle in your eye. I know this is your want. Throughout this book, the tone is exasperated from time to time, but generally good-humored, hilarious from beginning to end, and the underlying good-humored. This will all work out. But listen to the cumulative accumulation of lessons that one learns in reading this book. It costs a fortune. Intellectual standards have utterly collapsed. Political correctness is not merely a factor, but utterly regnant, totally dominant at institution after institution after institution. Why aren't you furious? Why aren't uh, you enraged? You know the old uh, joke about the guy who comes into the psychiatrist and he says, doctor, you got to come see my, my, uh, my brother because he thinks he's a chicken. And uh, the psychiatrist says, well, bring him in. You know, you just tell him he's not a chicken. He said, well, I would, but we need the eggs. And so this is sort of what we're doing with college education. There are two things that we know about college education, for sure, in America. One is that it costs too much, and the second is that not much learning goes on when the kids go to campus. These things are both established beyond doubt. But we still do it because we need the eggs, I guess, is the final answer. Okay, segment five. What is to be done? Bill Crystal, our friend Bill Crystal, I once heard him mention, this was in public, so I'm not, uh, he graduated from Harvard, he sent his son to Harvard, and he said, it is really a remarkable thing that you save all your life to send your children to perhaps the most prestigious institution, in his case, probably the most prestigious institution, but the most prestigious institution they can get into, you wipe out your life savings, to, and you hope that it doesn't do too much damage. That they don't become a Trotskyite. Mm -hmm. that, that the best you can hope is that it doesn't harm them too much. What's the way out? Well, there are, I, I'm not a reformer and I... It's, Why not? Because it's not in my, it, it's not in my personality makeup. All right. Um, uh, I, I do talk in there about some ideas that people have to try and restore some kind of rationality to the process, but we are so far gone and it is, all the momentum of the culture is so far in the other way um, that it seems to me almost inevitable. I mean, the only way out is through and we're going to keep going this way in which we have more and more people going to schools that are less and less competent in what we want them to do. I suspect that sooner or later, I talk about the possibility of a bubble, that this, that the whole higher education world is uh, poised to just, somebody's going to prick the balloon. Um, as I say, you know, the, the, we know that people don't get educated <laughs> for the most part in college. Uh, we know that it costs too much. And if any other industry in America failed in this way, automotive companies to talk about them again, they would collapse. You simply couldn't deliver Aside from the government, fail right? to it's like right. the federal well, government. Those right. are the two examples that just the federal government. We know the policy. and they're they're increasingly intertwined. Remember, I mean, a large percentage of the money that goes to colleges and universities now comes from the government, comes from taxpayers. So you're essentially paying twice uh, as a parent uh, sending stuff in. So uh, two two questions on the reform front. What about technology? These uh, remote learning, the for-profit universities such as the University of Phoenix. Is that purely a marginal uh, matter, or do you expect them actually to change the whole marketplace? Well, those, especially those private colleges, are very interesting because they do answer the question, what is college for? They are quite unapologetically answering to get a job. Right. And by sort of rationalizing what they do in that way, uh, they're detaching themselves from the rest of the in insanity that's going on with, you know, kids our kids. <laughs> um, and uh, so job training, preparing people for well-paying jobs, that will be taken care of. And in fact, the Obama administration is doing a very good job about that. They're trying to give money to community colleges whose sole purpose is not to introduce kids to queer theory, but is to teach them how to be computer programmers or something. The rest of it, the sort of realm where the middle, upper middle class 
liberal is, arts, broadly liberal pursued, arts, humanities right? is right. Uh, will is ripe for the bubble, and I think will probably collapse. And the second question on the reform front: What about the small institutions dotted here and there that seem to have either been founded with or to have acquired a certain defiant spirit? Hillsdale, mm. for example, which refuses any federal funding whatsoever, or small Catholic colleges, St. Thomas Aquinas out in California, Christendom down here in Front Royal, Virginia. Now these are by and large small institutions, entirely on the margins, a sort of very, very special set of sub-niches, or is there a prospect that over a decade as more and more people realize how the insanity, as you call it, of the main educational marketplace more such institutions will be founded, they'll become, what do you think? Uh, my uh, impression is, I think w you and I are good instant cases. We're, we're both believers in sort of traditional education. Uh, we were both sort of politically, culturally conservative people. And but you didn't away. send your kid to Hillsdale, as, as wonderful as Hillsdale is, Hillsdale and I is didn't wonderful. either. Uh, and, you know, I, I said, why doesn't this industry collapse? because it so clearly doesn't deliver because on what it promises. you and I have no spine. Be yeah, well, look in the mirror. It's parents like me, and to a lesser extent you, uh, that keep this fantasy alive. Andy, would you close our time together by reading a passage from your book? I've marked what I'd like you to read. Do you mind? No, no, no. In fact, you've edited what I was going to read. <laughs> Changed a few words around. <laughs> I've inserted swooned and doomed. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is about uh, the, the terrible moment when we actually had to drop our son off um, at college. Um, and I have to say, uh, I'm sort of a sentimental person, I guess, but, but it was a, quite a um, moving <laughs> experience to me, but as you'll see. Uh, we needed gas for the drive home. I found a gas station not far from the dorm at the edge of campus. I tried not to talk, and I thought I caught my wife giving me sidelong glances. I pulled up to the pump, slid the credit card in the slot, and shoved the nozzle in the tank of the family van. My sadness, grief almost, flamed up insanely into anger at all the things a man can't control. I started to mention an anecdote I recalled, I don't know why, from his first day in kindergarten long, long ago. Stop it, my wife said to me. I told myself I wouldn't start blubbering, but I will if you keep this up. All right. I'm just trying to acknowledge that this is the end of something. An important part of our life just ended. It's the end of something, my wife said, but it's also the beginning of something else, something wonderful. To make an end is to make an, a beginning. T.S. Eliot said that. I learned that in college, and I didn't buy it then either. No, she said, this is a moment we should be proud of. We did it. We did it. We raised him to be a strong, kind, happy, self-confident young man, and we succeeded. It's what we were supposed to do. If you want to sulk because we did what we were supposed to do and we did it well, go ahead. But I refuse, and don't do it around me. She was right, and I knew it, or I thought I knew it, and in time I might even come to believe it. For the moment, I would sulk. I got in and slammed the door. I turned the key, and when the engine roared, I gunned it, until I felt a sickening tug and heard the sound of sheet metal being ripped from welded bolts because I'd left the nozzle in the tank. Andrew Ferguson author of Crazy You, One Dad's Crash Course in Getting His Kid Into College. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, very much. For Uncommon Knowledge, I'm Peter Robinson.